Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Worship in the church begins in us. Now, I need to introduce or reintroduce somebody to you that many of you don't know. Some of you do. It's been a long time. But I want you to meet Carrie Ann Wheeler. Carrie, wave at us. Just wave right there. Get your hand up. You, Okay, there she goes right there. Okay. Carrie Ann is from our church years back. This is from a church years back. Uh, this church had quite a revival among college students years back. Forty of them surrendered to the ministry and went out across the nation. She was one of those. And now she's going across the nation. Working, she works on radio. San Diego, K-Love. Is that right? What? Sacramento, sorry. Sacramento works for K-Love and reaches people all over the United States. I just want you to know that she's from us. Thank you. We're proud to have you. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, worship in the church begins in us. I've got um, 10 grandchildren. Two of those are little heathen boys. And their names are Trace and Lane. Their mother had a birthday the other day. And, of course, Trace and Lane. Trace is seven. Lane is six. And they were trying to give her a birthday present. And so they were raffling around trying to find something. But they didn't have any money, and they don't have any car, and they didn't have any way to get anything. And so they went into the toy box, and they dug around in the toy box, and one of them came up with Andrea's pen that they'd stolen and put in the toy box. And one of them came up with a flower that was out of the toy box. And they took some uh, loose-leaf paper, and they wrapped it up, and they taped it, and they wrote, To Mom from Trace, To Mom from Lane. And they gave it to her. Now, what they were giving to her was her own things. They were giving them back. But she was so excited to get it because it was heartfelt. And she opened that paper, and there was probably 10 pounds of tape on it. She had to borrow my pocket knife to cut it off. And it was written in their handwriting, to mom from Trace, to mom from Lane. And it was so touching because really what they did was they gave back to her her own things. But what they really did was they gave themselves to her. Now, what we're going to talk about today is worship, the worship of the Almighty God. But everything belongs to Him. So when we give back to Him, we're giving back to Him His things. But He's just as excited to get them from you as Andre was excited to get them from them. And what we're really doing and what He really wants is us. So as we give to him, we're really giving him of ourselves. In chapter 4, verse 1, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now go back one verse to the last verse in chapter 3. You are Christ. Christ is God's. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about family. Now, as we start to talk about worship, as Paul is going to talk about worship to the Corinthian church, the worship of Almighty God, he's going to talk to us about sacrifice. See, all worship is sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it's sacrifice. In the New Testament, it's sacrifice. We are to be living sacrifices, Paul says. And so what worship is, is sacrifice back to God. But now he's going to tell us what sacrifice is. Two words. Verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards and servants. Two very powerful words. And God says what sacrifice is, is stewardship and servanthood. And we're to become that. If we're ever going to worship God. Now what happens is we come on Sunday morning and we say, okay, we've got to worship God. And we come to the worship service and, we, and as we leave we say, well, you know, the preacher, he just didn't 
do what he usually does. He wasn't really quite up to snuff. And not only that, he wore a zoot suit. And the music, the music, it was okay, but I didn't really feel the worship there today. Well, one of the reasons we're not really feeling the worship there today, maybe, is because worship begins in us during the week. And what Paul is going to tell these Corinthians, he's going to tell them, hey, I want you to learn how to worship, and I want you to know what it is. If you're going to worship the Almighty God, you've got to know what worship is. So he gives them two words here in verse 1. Servants and stewards. And Paul said, that's what I am as an apostle, and that's what you're to become. So first off, we want to look at what stewardship is. Verse 2, moreover, is required in stewards that one be found what? Faithful. Y'all know what a steward is? What is a steward? Well, a steward is somebody who has, who's taking care of somebody else's stuff. That's what a steward is. And what stewardship is, is to, as God gives us his stuff, we're to take care of it. Now, what a steward's supposed to do is he takes it, he invests it, he makes profit on it, and then he gives it all back to God. He doesn't keep any of it. Why is it so important that, in verse 2, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful? Why is it important? What's the most important thing about stewardship? That he's honest, that he's faithful, he's trustworthy. Otherwise, he steals it. It becomes his. You know, what's happening in the church today and what's happening in the worship today is the church is stealing God's worship. It stopped becoming worship to God, and it started becoming our worship. It started becoming, well, do I like those songs or not? Do I like what he preached or not? Do I, do I, do I? And God says, wait, wait, wait. I need you to understand something about worship, about worshiping the almighty, eternal, everlasting, creative God. And the first thing that we need to know is stewardship. Now, the first thing a steward does is he manages other people's stuff. We are to manage God's kingdom. It's kind of interesting. This word steward. Oikonomos. And really where we get the word dispensation and how we are dispensationalists is from this particular word. And it has to do with God's church being a steward. Watch this. Verse 2. Required a steward that one be found faithful. Verse 1, stewards of the, of the what? Mysteries of God. It's talking about the gospel. Who's in charge of spreading the gospel in the world today? The church. And we have become stewards. We're to manage God's stuff for him and give it back to him. And that's what worship is, is we don't have anything ourselves, and so we take God's stuff and give it back to him, and that's worship. You know, when we tithe in our money, it's really not ours. Who gave it to us? And so we give him back part of that as worship. But what I want to talk to you today about is stewardship is verse 2. That he be found faithful. And really what we're talking about here is loyalty. Now let's talk about loyalty for just a minute. It's somebody that you can count on. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when. If they call on you, they can count on you wherever you are. No matter what's going on, no matter where it is, no matter when it is. When they call, you show up. Now, you know, really, what we're talking about here are some characteristics of chopper pilots, helicopter pilots in the military. Really what we're talking about, you call, they haul. They go into some of the most, most gosh awful battles because we've got some people down there that need them. 
no matter what, no matter where, no matter when. Now, I just happen to have a friend. His name is Leon Ingram, who was a chopper pilot during, war, um, during the Vietnam War. He did two tours. On the second tour, he got shot down. He was one lost pagan pig. He's still fairly pagan. But when he got shot down, as the chopper crashed, he lived through it. He jumped up, he unbuckled, got out, and as he was running away, they zipped him up the back of the leg. And so now he walks like this. Clop, 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 clop. But he is my friend. When we graduated from seminary, he and his wife were living in Fort Worth, and it was two months before we were going to be, get called to Amarillo to our church here. And I called Leon, and, and we had places lined up for everything except for the first week. We had no place to live. We didn't have any place to go. All our stuff is in a little U-Haul, but we had no place to go. We were having a horrible blizzard here, one of the worst blizzards we've ever had. Couldn't get here. I called up Leon. I said, hey, I know this is a little inconvenient, but do you care if me and my children and my wife come and live with you for a week? He said, brother, we'd love to have you. I thought, yes. He was a test pilot at Bell Helicopter in Fort Worth. Now, what test pilots do is they take it and see if, if they really have fixed the thing or does it crash. I mean, that's what they do. And his crashed several times, but he lived through every one of them. That's the kind of people they are. They're nuts. Well, when they built Bell Helicopter here, they moved some of the test pilots from there to here, and they moved him at a moment's notice. And he called me up, and he said, Hey, I hate to ask you, but I've got to come and live in Amarillo, and I've got no place to live. Can I come and live with you for two months? Now, we had a little bitty house. We'd just gotten out of seminary, and we are here. And I said, yes, we'd love to have you. And he came and lived with us for eight weeks. Now, he's crazy. But he's my friend. I called him one day, a few years back. I said, hey, Leon. One of my daughters is, is needs some help, and she needs a place to stay, and she needs a place to live for I don't know how long. And she's got nothing. Can you help? He said, have her call me. I've got a bedroom that needs somebody to stay in it. She went and stayed with him, with he and his wife, for weeks. And their family. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when, that's loyalty. He called me up this last year, this last winter, and he was terribly shaken. I knew something was horribly wrong. And he said, you know that, that giant avalanche that they had over in Nepal? I said, yeah, what about it? He said, my son's over there on that mountain. He's climbing that mountain. And I need some prayer. You got time to pray? Said, I've got time. And then after that, we prayed every day, twice a day for that boy. His name was David. And then I got the call from Leon. He said, hey, you remember you were praying for that kid? And I said, yeah, I remember. <laughs> he said, they found him. And he's alive. Thanks for your prayers. I said, you're welcome. got another friend Tom Condry he did a tour in Vietnam as a marine when he got out he saw the great need he signed back up with the army and he became a chaplain and we were at seminary together and he lived just the lot behind us he and his wife back there and their two daughters and and uh, our family lived right across the way and I was working I was carrying two jobs and came home one night Jeannie came home one night while I was working till midnight and when she got to the house with all the babies the front door was standing open. She looked in the front door, and the place was just a wreck. We'd been robbed. And 
she just drove over to Tom's house and she said, well, I, I've got to have some help. It's, it was 11 o'clock at night. Tom was in his skivvies. She said, I, I think someone's in our house and I don't know what to do. Tom said, you stay right here. He told his wife, call the police. This is before 911. Call the police. And then Tom grabbed his old 45 and in his underwear, he went running out across there and got to our house and he does this. Then he goes in the first behind the chest of drawers. And then and he cleared the house and turned the lights on. By that time, the police were there. And, because it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter where, and it doesn't matter when. If you're a steward. Because in verse 2, it's required in stewards that they be found loyal. got a call one night from Tom and he was weeping Tom never said anything he just did it he said Alan I, I need you I said what happened man he said one of my daughters fell through the ice and she drowned my 8 year old daughter living in Oklahoma at the base there we just Got in the car. We didn't pack anything. We just drove to their house. There were people there, but so was I. And we just sat with him for two days. And we sat with his wife while she went through the funeral, and Tom did part of the funeral. It was a chaplain. Tom was always loyal to me. That's what loyalty is. Now what Paul is going to be talking about right here is how we learn to worship. Now there's two things about loyalty that we need to know. Number one, you have to know them really well. You've got to know them really well. You, you know their good points and you know their bad points. And number two, you've got to love them with agape love. Now what Paul is going to tell the church here today is how we learn to worship. And what worship is is sacrifice. And then he's going to break that down into two words. The first word is stewardship. And moreover, brethren, it's required of a steward that he be found loyal. During the week... When God calls on us, he calls on us to do something because somebody that he loves is in trouble. And it's not us. It's somebody else. But when we come to worship, we come on Sunday morning to worship, but we worship out of the fullness of our heart because during the week when God has called on us, we have answered the call. Somebody's in trouble. He could be stuck up on a mountain in Nepal with an avalanche that's, that killed 3,000 people. He could have somebody that just robbed his house. He could have somebody that's in his house. He could need moral support. He could need love. He could need care. But somebody's in trouble, and God calls on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to go take care of that. And when he calls, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter when, and it doesn't matter where. We go. You call, we haul. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is. One of the reasons that the Special Forces is always so eager to go in to bad places to save helicopter pilots is because those same chopper pilots have gone in to save them. How many times has God saved us from something? You know, of course, God doesn't need any help. But God's kids do. The wife of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church does. And when God calls us to go, we're supposed to get up and go. 
sometime during the week. And then when we come back on Sunday morning to worship, we're worshiping out of the fullness of our heart as our hearts join with his heart because we have something in common. Now watch the rest of this passage. Verse 4, well, verse 3. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the what? Would you underline that word hearts? Because I want to tell you something about these two guys that I know. One of them is a chopper pilot or was, and he was a test pilot. He was crazy and he was a nut. The other one is a, a, a colonel. He just retired from the military. He's a colonel chaplain. He lived over in one of, uh, what's that crazy guy that we took down in Iraq? He lived in Osama bin Laden's, one of his palaces. He had an office there after we took it over. He's kind of crazy, too, running around his underwear with a 45. And you know, oh, Leon, Leon and I don't agree on doctrine a whole lot because Leon's crazy. I mean, sometimes his doctrine doesn't match up with mine. That doesn't matter. Because when I call on him for help, he comes. And when he calls on me for help, I come. Because our hearts have been knit together in love. Now what we're talking about is agape love. We're not talking about Valentine's love today. We're talking about agape love. To agape love someone, you have to know them really well. And you have to love them a lot. Because he may call you to go someplace you don't want to go. But if you love him and he says, my kids are in trouble, you show up. That's what Paul is saying right here. It's a very small thing I should be judged by you or by a human court. Verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, reveal the counsels of the heart. We don't always get it right, but if you love God with all your heart, Now, starting in verse 8, the second thing he's going to talk about is servanthood. See, the first one was stewardship. The second word he's going to use is servanthood. Starting in verse 8, he's going to talk to them about their worship. You are already full, exclamation point. You are already rich. You've reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign and that we also might reign with you. But he's talking to the church here and he said, Oh my goodness, I didn't realize you guys were already kings. I didn't realize you had need of nothing. I didn't realize that you're rich. For I think that God has displaced us, the apostles, last, displayed us, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. Oh, you're so wise. You guys are so smart. I didn't realize how smart you were. We're weak. You're so strong. Now, who's talking? The Apostle Paul. It's tongue-in-cheek. You are distinguished. We're dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We, we have been made as the filth of the world and the off-scouring of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. You see, what he's saying is, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the United States looks really good. We're so rich, powerful, and knowledgeable, and distinguished. 
And what God is looking for is some servants who've got their hands dirty and who've been in the war. He's not really concerned about how good we look, how distinguished we are, and how smart we are. What he's really worried about is, is there anybody out there doing the work? Paul said, man, I've been beaten. I'm hungry. We have been defamed. We've been talked ugly about. I was watching Billy Graham last night as he was preaching in Tacoma, Washington in 1983, and he was talking about the wind blowing out there and his hair, and he was having trouble with it. And he stopped me and goes, did you know your newspaper said that I wear a hairpiece? I don't, he said, and he reached up and he pulled it. I don't. But we've been defamed. <laughs> He's talked ugly about just because he showed up to preach Christ. Verse 10, we're fools for Christ's sake. Oh, you're so wise. Verse 16, therefore, brethren, I urge you, imitate me. Now, how can he say that? Because stewardship is so personal. Servanthood is so personal. Paul said, I've been beat up and I'm hungry and I'm dirty. And I'm writing to the church today and man, you guys look good and you're so smart and you're so wise and there ain't anybody doing anything. What is worship anyhow? Worship is when after we've been out during the week, we come back together and we praise God of what He did. When we come back together, we just worship God for what we've seen Him do. Now, if we don't have our hands dirty and we didn't go when He called, we didn't see Him do anything. But if you're out there working in your job, just doing your thing, and some, some person comes up and they need help or they need comfort or they need, it may not even be anybody you know. And you provide that right then and right there as God brought them across your path. When you come back to church Sunday, we worship. We sing praises to God, and we sing them with all our heart because we know what our God is capable of. I mean, last week, the roses and I really worshiped because he was found with a mass in his lung. It was as big as a ping pong ball, and they did surgery on it last week, and we didn't know what it was, did we? usually not good but we were together on it and when we came to church Sunday we were praising God because it was a tumor but it was benign and they just took it out and now most of his pain <laughs> is gone that's when we worship When God calls, we haul. We go when, we go where, we go how, but we go. And we may not do a good job of it. We may not be the best person at it. It doesn't matter if you're the best chopper pilot or not. If you showed up, none of those guys on the ground under fire are thinking, wow, I've seen better landings than that. As he comes in, bam, he comes in hard. And they all jump in, and off he goes. Oh, i got to tell you a story. It has nothing to do with anything, but Leon told me. He said he was hauling a bunch of troops one day, coming up out of one of those valleys, and he said the wind is really bad on those things, and they were under fire. And he said all of a sudden he lost control of the, of the chopper. He said it started going here and there, and he said I could not control it, I could not contain it. I looked back over my shoulder and I yelled, Hang on, guys, it's going to be a rough. And he said, One of the seats was empty. He goes, Oh, God. So 
Well, they're flying around. They're just going everywhere. And he said, did he fall out? Did he fall out? And they went, no. He said, I had no idea what that meant. I thought they told me our rotor had been hit. He said, I was fighting that thing. And he said, in a minute, a pair of feet come in from the other side of the door and slide through. And all of a sudden, I got my control back. And he said, when I landed, I said, did something happen? You guys fix something up there? He goes, no, no, I bet that guy 25 bucks, he wouldn't go across the top in full flight. Sometimes you just want to kill them yourself. All right, now, let's look at what servanthood is. Paul just described it to you, and then we're going to stop. Verse 11. To this present hour, verse 11, to this present hour, right now, he said, we're hungry. We're both hungry and thirsty, and we are poorly clothed. We are beaten, and we're homeless. We labor working with our own hands. Our hands are dirty. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world and the off-scouring of all things until now. Would you underline it? Until now. Verse 11, to the present hour, right now. Therefore, brethren, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love, in agape, and a spirit of gentleness? You see, what worship is, is during the week we get our hands dirty. During the week we, we go into places and we do things for God's children and for God's people. You don't have to go find somebody you don't know. Most of the time, it's God's going to send you somebody you already know. But when you're doing your job, and as you're out there, when God calls, we are loyal. And most of the time, when God calls you to go someplace, it's for one of the family. It's for one of us. Some of them are just hurting, and they just need somebody to go hurt with them. Some of them are rejoicing, and they need somebody to rejoice with them. Somebody has a baby. You go. You go rejoice with them. Rejoicing with those who rejoice, and weeping with those who weep. A friend loveth at all times. And then when we come back together on Sunday morning, we really worship. Because what we're excited about is what God did during the week and what God is doing. And thank God He used me. Thank you, Lord, for using me and letting me go. Lord, thanks for letting me get my hands dirty. I really don't want to be like one of those stupid Pharisees. God didn't call me to be a priest. He called me to be a pastor. He didn't call me to be a Jewish priest. He didn't call me to be a high priest. He called me to be a pastor. What did he call you to do? He's calling every one of us to go help. They call. God calls. You haul. And then I found out when I need somebody, they come. Because everybody needs somebody sooner or later. And when Jeannie and I needed somebody, lots of you somebody showed up. Would you bow with me? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would you teach us your word, and Lord, would you teach us how to love you with all our heart? all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. Would you teach us how to be loyal? 
Lord, you teach us how to be stewards. Would you teach us how to be servants? Help us to do so. Father, use us, please. Blessed be the name of God. In Christ's name.